probably doesn't help you. But um, I also have the outline on the U version. Um, for those of you that are using the app, um, just know that I have all of the verses from Zephaniah in the app and just the ones that we're using. Um, because to really cover the whole book, we're going to kind of be jumping back and looking at contrasts and, and, and really looking at the overall message of the book. And so instead of making you guys scroll, for those of you with the electronic Bibles, scroll really, really fast to get back to chapter 3 and then really, really fast to get back to one, chapter 1, I just had all of the ones that we're using. So just, just so you know that. Um, and before we jump in, uh, you should know that uh, Zephaniah is very much like the rest of the Minor Prophets in that uh, this book is chock full of oracles of judgment. And some of you guys might be sitting here tonight and you're thinking, all right, judgment again, getting a little bit of tired of uh, listening to all of these, these messages of judgment. Um, but the Israelites actually, believe it or not, were also very tired of hearing messages of judgment. And so um, in that, we can relate with them. And uh, even just in that uh, point, I think we can have a little bit of a parallel lesson in just that idea. Um, but as we get started here, um, I want to start with a story that kind of illustrates um, Zephaniah's job. Um, and I sometimes hesitate to tell some of my college stories because now I'm a director of a college student organization that houses 96 college students and does events with all of you guys, and I don't necessarily want you all to repeat the things that I did. But um, YOLO. Uh, so let me set the scene for you. Uh, two friends, me, my friend Elijah, we're in our room. Across from us, my friend KB, he's in a single room, a uh, homemade battering ram, and a pizzazz. How many of you guys know what a pizzazz is? No, it is not a fly zapper. Um, the pizzazz is probably one of the greatest uh, marvels to come out of the industrial and technological revolution um, that we have today. And what it is is a little tiny pizza cooker. It is a, uh, it's like a little pizza tray, and it spins around, and there's like a little light that's like kind of the oven thing, and it just cooks things as it goes by. And it cooks everything that you could ever need in college. Pizza, pizza bites, pizza rolls, pizza bagels, everything that you could ever need. And uh, our friend KB, he came back uh, to school one weekend with a pizzazz that um, one of his uh, family members had given him or something, and he thought it was his, but uh, we thought it was ours at the same time. And so we would take the pizzazz and have it in our room, and then he would take it back, and then we would go and take it from him, and then he would take it back, and this happened for a little while, and at one point, we had the pizzazz in our room for like quite a while, and, uh, and, and we were all hanging out in our room, and he got a little mad at us for something, I don't remember what it was, and he was like, fine, I'm taking the pizzazz back, and we're like, no, you're not, and he grabs the pizzazz, he runs to his room, we jump out of the bed, we chase him, he slams the door and locks it, and we're like, oh man, we're like, wait, let's go get the battering ram. So the battering ram is a traffic cone that we acquired. Um, it's, one of those, it's one of those real tall ones, kind of skinny, has a really heavy base um, on it. And like, surprisingly, you, you kind of need two people to really get it going. And we realized that it was a makeshift battering ram when we stuck a soccer ball in it and couldn't get it back out, but it was still like kind of halfway protruded. So we get the battering ram, we're like, oh man, we're going to knock his door down, but we're joking. And uh, so we hit it a couple times, and like on the third time we look and we realize there's like, like it's actually bending the door in. And we're like hey, we might be able to actually do this. <laughs> and so, against our better judgment, we boom, 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 keep hitting and hitting, and eight, nine, ten, I don't know how many it was, and we burst the door open, it's flings shut, hits the, hits the wall, we run in, and KB is acting like he's sleeping. And we're like, what are you doing? And he's like, oh, how'd you guys get in here? We're like, dude, we just knocked your door down with a battering ram. Like, what do you think, what do you th how do you think we got in here? And so we take the pizzazz and we run back. And uh, that was not the end of the, uh, the pizzazz battles and the back and forth that we had with that. Um, but I bring up this story to illustrate the job of the prophets. The prophets were like a battering ram that God used to get his word to the people. And Zephaniah is no exception to this rule. The prophets, they came with a message from God and they just keep hitting and hitting and hitting. And the people didn't always like it very much because some of it's kind of convicting, you know? Sometimes the prophets were coming for something that they wanted to keep, like the pizzazz, but usually it was like sin or pride or something, right? And the prophets keep coming, they keep hitting and hitting and hitting, and the Israelites didn't like it, and so sometimes they just killed some of the prophets. Um, actually, in, in uh, uh, Stephen's speech, who was the first martyr in the New Testament for Jesus in Acts 7.52 before he was murdered, he says to the people who are about to stone him, he says, which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? 
And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whom you have now betrayed and murdered. You see, the prophets, they were like a battering ram. They just kept battering and battering and battering. And they were trying to break through the doors to the people's hearts and minds with a message from God. And this is really important, and, and their job was really important because God wanted them to know. He wanted his people to know that there were consequences for their actions. God wanted them to know that there was still time to repent. God wanted them to know what his word was and how to follow him. And to, he also wanted them to be able to damn themselves if that's what they chose to do. And so Zephaniah comes in hot like a battering ram in this first message. If you'll read with me, chapter 1, starting in verse 2. Read with me. God is talking. I will utterly sweep away everything from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. I will sweep away man and beast. I will sweep away the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea and the rubble with the wicked. I will cut off mankind from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. I will stretch out my hand against Judah and against all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and I will cut off from this place the remnant of Baal and the name of the idolatrous priests along with the priests, those who bow down on the roofs to the host of heavens, those who bow down and swear to the Lord and yet swear by Milcom, which is another word, word name for um, the God of Molech, and those who have turned back from following the Lord who do not seek the Lord or inquire of him. Now, why in the world is God so angry? I mean, seriously, this isn't like a message where God is like, hey guys, you kind of messed up and I'm going to have to discipline you. I'm sorry, but like, this is just the way it is. I mean, this is like, this is big stuff. God is saying, I will utterly sweep away everything from the face of the earth. Man, beast, birds, fish, everything. Why is God so angry? So if we go back to the first verse and we read the superscription, which is kind of the, 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 the title of, of these books, and they usually give a, a, a description of the prophet. I talked about that with Obadiah. It was just like the prophet Obadiah. Um, but Zephaniah actually has like the, the largest one. And so let's read verse one and, and begin to gain a little bit of context for um, Zephaniah and what he was dealing with. It says, the word of the Lord that came to Zephaniah, the son of Cushi, son of Gedaliah, son of Amariah, son of Hezekiah. Now, usually, they don't need to go back that far to identify who it was, but um, this was important because Zephaniah was the great-great-grandson of King Hezekiah. And so, uh, it already kind of tips us off to know that Zephaniah probably had access to, like, the royal courts. He probably kind of had, he, he knew the, the, the what's what and the who's who in the land. He knew about things going on. He had access to the important people, the officials of the land, things like that. He was probably a fairly important guy. Um, and then God called him to be a prophet, and I'm sure people didn't like him after that. But then it says, in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah. Now, you guys remember King Josiah, right? What was he famous for? Being a really good king, what specifically made him a really good king? Being what? Being eight. I mean, that was pretty cool, to be honest. But what did Josiah do? Does anybody remember? He found the books of the law. Yes, two of you said it. Um, so Josiah, during his time, he found the books of the law. I mean, can you believe that? Like they had lost the books of the law for so long and then some priest is like, hey, we uncovered this under some dust and rubble in the temple that we don't use anymore and uh, here it is, Josiah. And, uh, what, and so then Josiah, he kind of made, uh, he, he, uh, he made some like ref reforms and he, he tried to bring God's word kind of back on the map and back into society. Um, and, and there were some good things about it, but what's the problem with government mandated morality? It doesn't work. Why? Why though? I mean, it's not to say that there shouldn't be laws, but why doesn't it work? Sin nature, yes. So, so Josiah is making all of these laws and he's trying to like, like bring uh, God's word back into society, um, but the people were still wicked. Their hearts were still wicked and we see that. We're kind of tuned into that in verse four, right? It says, I will cut off from this place the remnant of Baal. So there's still a remnant. There's still a, a people that are worshiping Baal, even during these, these uh, times of reform where, where Josiah is bringing God's word back onto the map. And then in verse five, it says, um, those who bow down and swear to the Lord and yet swear by Milcom. So not only are there people that are just like, no, nah, we're not gonna worship God, we're gonna worship Baal, but there's also people that are like, 
all right, we'll, we'll play along. We'll, we'll come and we'll do the temple thing. We'll do the King Josiah thing. We'll worship God, but yeah, we're going to also worship Molech and, and, and participate in all the bad stuff with that too. And so it, it didn't change the, the hearts and minds of the people. Only God can do that. And so though Josiah did a lot of good, um, the worship of idols and, and had darkened the hearts of the people and it was just too entrenched in society. And, um, and, and we know this because uh, we, we know that Josiah's uh, reform was kind of more like a momentary uh, societal reformation than it was a true spiritual revival. Um, and, and we know this because as soon as King Josiah died, he was killed in battle, and, and Israel fell right back into just as bad, if not worse, the, the wickedness that they, that they had come out of during, Josiah, during uh, the king, time of King Josiah. And so, again, we still, we, we, we ask the question, we have some context, but why is God so angry? And I think that part of this is because uh, they weren't just wicked, but now the people were wicked and they were two-faced about it, right? You know, maybe they put away their, their Baal idols and they put away some of their sinfulness, and they, but they didn't really get rid of it. They're like, yeah, we'll put it in the closet for later, just, just in case, you know, they, or, or, or they were worshiping God and then just going straight over to some other temple and worshiping some other God. So they weren't just wicked, but they were two-faced about it. They weren't just wicked, but they also knew better. I mean, for goodness sake, they had uncovered God's word, God's literal word. Who knows how long it was, it was lost for. And instead of treasuring it and guarding it and keeping it safe and, 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 and following its rules and, and, and keeping it in, in, in such a place of reverence that even Nicolas Cage and his wildest fantasies could never steal it, they <laughs> discarded it again. And so God is not happy about this. God is angry because not only are they wicked, but they know better. And so God in this environment, this is the environment that God sends Zephaniah in to shake the people, to grab the people and say, hey, listen up. God has a message for you. And Zephaniah comes in with the uh, usual uh, words and powerful imagery um, that prophets do and, and the poetry of a thousand warriors. And he comes in with God's message and he makes it pretty clear what is expected of the people and what will happen if they don't change their hearts. And so if you'll follow along with me, I want to um, highlight a few um, of, of, of uh, Zephaniah's uh, messages and some of the word pictures and some of the things that, that he was giving to them, some of the things that would have resonated really strongly with the people in chapters 1 and 2. So the first one is, uh, is verse 7. It says, Be silent before the Lord God, for the day of the Lord is near. The Lord has prepared a sacrifice and consecrated his, his guests. And on the day of the Lord's sacrifice, I will punish the officials and the king's sons and all who array themselves in foreign attire. Now, I don't know if you guys caught the wording there, but what is being said is that God is, is, is coming and he's going to bring judgment. And the judgment that it will be like is a sacrifice. And the sacrifice are the people. Like, it's pretty, it's pretty brutal. And then in verse 14, we read a little further. It says, The great day of the Lord is near, near and hastening fast. The sound of the day of the Lord is bitter. The mighty man cries aloud there. Now, I, I don't know about you guys. I don't know if this is like a, a boy thing or what, but um, do any of you guys remember, like as a kid on the playground or something, uh, going up to your friends and being like, yeah, my dad could beat up your dad, right? <laughs> and maybe you're like, yeah, uh, you know, my dad's stronger than your dad, or my dad could do this, and your dad, and then one kid's like, yeah, my, kid's, my dad's in the military, so he could beat up all your dads. And like, there's this like, little like, verbal jousting with kids. I don't know, do the girls do that? Girls do that too, okay. Um, so it's just a thing, and, and I think the reason for that is because, you know, as a kid, your dad is, is the, the most powerful guy, right? He's the one that lays down the law. He's authority. He's strong. He's the protector, right? All of these things. And so when, when, uh, when we have that image in our mind, but then I want to ask you guys this, how many of you have ever seen your dad cry? Like that's, that'll like move you, Right? Or, or maybe how many of you have, had, have seen your dad get injured or get hurt and cry aloud, right? Cry out in pain. Like, that's when you know it's bad, right? That's when you know it's serious because your dad doesn't do that. Your dad's strong, right? 
And so the, the image that is here is that the mighty man cries aloud, but it's not a cry of, of, of mourning or a cry of pain. It's a cry of, of desperation, a cry of, of the Lord's judgment coming upon them. So this thing, this would have, these, these types of images would have resonated very strongly with them. They would have known exactly what Zephaniah is trying to say. Then a little down, a little further in verse 17, it says, I will bring distress on mankind so that they shall walk like the blind because they have sinned against the Lord. Their blood shall be poured out like dust and their flesh like dung. <laughs> no more explanation there really needed. Um, then, in, uh, then in chapter two, in verse 14, it says, herds shall lie down in her midst, all kinds of beasts, even the owl and the hedgehog shall lodge in her capitals. How many of you guys have seen I Am Legend? Only one of the greatest movies ever. Um, I Am Legend, one of my favorite uh, scenes in that movie is, is when he comes in, he's driving through New York City, right? And it's like, it's all overgrown. It's completely desolate and bare. There's nobody there. And, and then all of a sudden, he's like hunting deer in the middle of New York City. And then a lion comes out. And it's like, it's like this, this crazy apocalyptic scene. I don't know that it could get any more so, right? And that's exactly what God is saying here. He's saying, even your strongest cities, your biggest cities, your biggest capitals will be destroyed and it'll be a place where little woodland creatures come and make their nests. Like that's what God is saying here. And so Zephaniah as a prophet, he's delivering these messages and he's saying, he's saying, guys, guys, there's, there's something going on here. You need to listen to God. Judgment is coming, Right? And he looks around at the people of Israel and he's, and he's talking with them face to face and he's looking at groups and he's looking at society and all of a sudden he's realizing that no matter how much he preaches to them, how much he tells them judgment is coming, no matter what kind of language or wording he uses, he realizes that the people don't care. And they don't think that God does either. Chapter one, verse 12 says, and this is God talking, and I will punish the men who are complacent, those who say in their hearts, the Lord will not do good, nor will he do ill. You see, the people didn't think that God cared. And even if they thought he cared, they said, nah, he's not gonna do anything about it, even if he does care. You see, the people had gotten away with their sin for so long. They'd gotten away with their, their two-faced worship. They'd gotten away with, with just doing whatever they wanted, even though King Josiah was saying, hey, here's God's word, we gotta follow it. Maybe some of them even were like, hey, you know what? Yeah, let's get rid of our idols. Let's, let's, let's do the whole King Josiah thing. And maybe they didn't really notice anything different. They were like, yeah, you know what? God doesn't care. And if he does, he's not gonna do anything about it because God won't do any good and he won't do any bad. And so they were complacent and in their hearts, this is what they said. But Zephaniah seeing this, this, this uh, attitude of the people he, he, he comes to them and he's not just proclaiming judgment, but he's also proclaiming the, the ability to repent and he's proclaiming God's mercy and he's saying, he's saying, guys, okay, I wanted to make sure it wasn't a fire alarm, sorry. <laughs> and so Zephaniah, he's coming to the people, right? And he's, and he's seeing this, this attitude in their hearts and, and this is a direct quote, so probably some of them are even saying this. They're like, you know, Zephaniah, yeah, your prophecies are real weird and cool and whatnot, but like, God doesn't care. He's not going to do anything. And so Zephaniah is coming and he's saying, no, guys, it's not just bad. Like, like God wants you to repent. And so chapter two, verses one through three, Zephaniah is saying, gather together. Yes, gather, O shameless nation, before the decree takes effect, before the day passes away like chaff, before there comes upon you the burning anger of the Lord. Zephaniah is saying, guys, there's still time to repent. Guys, wake up. There's still time to act. There's still time to repent. Seek the Lord, all you humble of the land, who do his just commands. Seek righteousness, seek humility. Perhaps you may be hidden on the day of the anger of the Lord. And so at this point, Zephaniah is, is screaming to the people and he's shaking them. And he's saying, wake up. Wake up. In college, I was a model student, as you guys could tell from my earlier story. And so with that sort of a reputation, I naturally started studying for most of my tests at about two in the morning before they were ready to be done. And I remember this um, one particular night where um, 
we had been doing who knows what, and we finally decided, yeah, we've got a test at 7.15 a.m., and we should probably start studying. It's about 2 o'clock, and um, so we go into one of our rooms, and we're studying hard, and um, it was freshman year. It was pretty basic stuff. It was like Old Testament um, survey, so there's like some, some, some obscure kind of names and, uh, and dates and places and, and, and things to know, but um, we're studying. We're studying about four or five hours. It's like around 5 o'clock, and I just hit a wall. You guys know what that's like. You, you, you hit a wall and you just, you know that like there's nothing you can do to just keep powering through. And I'm already like two or three energy drinks deep. There's, there's no coming back from this. So I'm like, guys, guys, I, I, have to, I have to sleep. Like, just let me go to sleep. I'm gonna sleep for like, like 30 minutes and then like wake me up in just enough time to like wake up, like review the material real quick and then, and then we'll go to the test. And so I just went to sleep on one of the beds in, in the room that we were in, and uh, I was instantly out. And uh, I'm sure that they did not study um, <laughs> at, at the point that I went to sleep, but they said they were. Um, and so, uh, so I'm asleep, and then the next thing I know, you know, that it's time for them to wake me up. And so they come up to me, and they're like, like, hey, Nathaniel, wake up. And I didn't move. They're like, hey, Nathaniel. And they shake me a little bit more. Wake up. And then they're like, man, he's not waking up. And so they're making a game out of it as, as one does, you know? And so they're like, Nathaniel! And they're like yelling at me like, wake up! And I'm still not waking up. And when I finally did wake up, I don't know what the exact like buildup to this point was, um, but it was like, I woke up to a jamboree of ukulele. I'm thinking there was a djembe in there and there was a pizza box and they were hitting on it and they were singing a song and it was kind of like this. They were like, this is the pizza box song. Wake up, it's time to get out of bed. And... <laughs> So that's what I woke up to. I was, I was pretty disoriented. I was pretty disoriented, and that's what I woke up to. And you know, it, in that moment, it took something big to wake me up, right? It took something loud. It took something really obnoxious to wake me up from my slumber. And that's what Zephaniah was doing here. He was trying to get to the people. He was trying to shake them to their senses. Sometimes we look and we're like, man, these are kind of insensitive messages from God. But Zephaniah is saying, guys, there is a lot at stake here. The eternal gravity of your souls is at stake here. It's time to wake up. And I wonder if we are in some ways like the Israelites. If we in some ways are, are dead, deadened to our sin, if we're complacent, and maybe we don't say it in our, in our hearts or with our words, but in our actions we say, you know, God's not going to do good and he's not going to do bad. Or maybe sometimes we get to a dark place and we're like, God doesn't care. And even if he does, he's probably not going to do anything about it. And I wonder if, if God in his, in his forbearance and his patience and his grace, and his long-suffering, and his slowness to anger, and every other description that you can find in the Bible has, has withheld judgment, withheld discipline, withheld uncomfortable wake-up calls in our lives, maybe as individuals, maybe as, as, as a group of people. And instead of acknowledging his grace and, and seeing that he is being patient and that he is f bearing with us in our sins and, and coming to God and saying, Lord, I repent, Instead, we're like the people that Zephaniah talks about in chapter 3, verse 7. This is God talking. I said, surely you will fear me. You will accept correction. Then your dwelling would not be cut off according to all that I have appointed against you. But all the more eager they were to make their deeds corrupt. Notice the, the emotion that God has here when he's saying this. I said, surely you will fear me. Surely you will accept the correction. But instead, all the more they were eager to make all of their deeds corrupt. You see, when we have this, this type of mindset in our lives of, of complacency towards God, and we, we think to ourselves, whether it's, it's, it's uh, verbally or whether it's, it's in our minds and our hearts or whether it's, it's actually in our actions, we're displaying that we think God doesn't care. God will not, neither do good, nor will he do ill. And essentially what we've said is that we don't think God cares about our materialism and our greed. We said that we don't think God cares about our obsession with, with safety or our obsession with, with financial security. 
We've said, you know what, we don't think God cares if, if we watch pornography just because it's on a popular TV show. We don't think God cares about our pride that's, that's rooted deep inside of us. And you know what, if he does, he's not gonna do anything about it anyways. Chapter two, verses one through three. Gather together, yes, gather, O shameless nation, before the decree takes effect, before the day passes away like chaff, before there comes upon you the burning anger of the Lord, before there comes upon you the day of the anger of the Lord, seek the Lord, all you humble of the land, who do his just commands. Seek righteousness, seek humility. Perhaps you may be hidden on the day of the anger of the Lord. You know what? The reason you're still alive at this very moment is because God does care. He cares very much and he's reaching out to you tonight and he's asking you to wake up. There was another uh, part of the uh, pizza box song that I left out conveniently. Um, but uh, part of what I woke up to was not just the jamboree of, of ukulele and pizza box and djembe and two sleep-deprived men screaming my name. Uh, but also what I woke up to was my cousin who was next door. And he woke up and he came out and he was angry about what he heard. Um, my cousin Ben, he's actually going to be a guest speaker, um, so you can talk to him about this. I think he's still kind of mad at me for this, um, but uh, he's going to be here later, later this week. Um, but he was, uh, he was 22. Uh, he had a part-time job. He had 21 credit hours. Some of you can test not to, rec not to do that ever. Um, he was preparing to be married, and he was looking for full-time jobs, and it was his finals week, and he had finals that were much harder than mine. And so you can tell that his viewpoint on life was a little bit different than 18-year-old, invincible, not a care in the world, Nathaniel, right? And so my cousin, he woke up, he came out of the door, and part of what I heard was him banging on the door as loud and hard as he could, and he said two words. He said, shut up. And it was so loud, and there was so much rage, and maybe even a little bit of hate in those words. And you see, when, when we look at these messages of God through the prophets, you know, he, he, here's the thing about God's word. When we, when we encounter God's word, there, there's really only two responses. We either fall on our knees and repent before God, or we stand up and we say, God, shut up. See, there's, there's, no, there's no real middle ground here. Some will awaken and others will yell back at God and say, shut up. But when we read God's word, when we're confronted with our sin, when God calls us to repent and to respond to his mercy and his grace, there's no middle ground. There's, there's no lukewarm. We either fall to our knees in humility and we, and we ask God, teach me how to serve you. Teach me how to live for you. Or we stand up and we muster all of the strength that we have. We bolster our pride and we say, God, Shut up. I don't need you. You see, the Israelites, they, 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 uh, they made their choice. They picked a side. They, they made their choice. They said, you know what? Um, we know what we want. And, and Zephaniah describes it here in chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Woe to her who is rebellious and defiled the oppressing city. She listens to no voice. She accepts no correction. She does not trust in the Lord. She does not draw near to her God. You see, the Israelites, they looked at God and they said, nah, you know what? We can do it on our own. We don't need to listen to your voice. We don't need to accept your correction. We're doing pretty fine on our own. In fact, you know, Zephaniah, uh, you know, you can keep doing your thing and whatnot, but frankly, we don't need some cosmic dude coming in with his weirdo prophet telling us how to live our lives because we're doing just fine. We like it on our own and we don't want it to be messed with. God, shut up. This is what the Israelites said. You see, when we talk about there not being a middle ground, what we have to do is that there's no lukewarm. We have to pick a side. We have to pick a side. We either pick the side of pride and we follow ourselves and our own pride and our own strength, or we follow God in humility and righteousness. And we lay down our pride and we follow him. And you see, God made it pretty clear about what each side offered. That's one of the great things about Scripture. And so let's look at what Zephaniah said about each side. Chapter 2, verse 15 says, This is the exultant city that lives securely, that said in her heart, I am, and there was no one else. 
What a desolation she has become, a lair for wild beasts. So the people picked pride, and what you get is destruction, desolation. The next contrast is in chapter 3, verses 8 and 13. If you look at chapter 3, verse 8, it says, Therefore wait for me, declares the Lord, for the day when I rise up to seize the prey. And so the, 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 the analogy here, the, the mental image that you're supposed to get is, is God is the wolf and you are the rabbit because you followed your pride. And then contrasted with the end of verse 13 where it says, God's people, for they shall graze and lay down and none shall make them afraid. So either God is against you or he is for you. It all depends on which side you're on. Again, we see another contrast in, in uh, verses 12 and 13. It says, Uh, of chapter three, it says, but I will leave in your midst a people humble and lowly. They shall seek refuge in the name of the Lord. Those who are left in Israel, they shall do no injustice and speak no lies, nor shall there be found in their mouth a deceitful tongue. Now the word for for left in verse 13 and, and actually in 12 as well is almost the exact same word that the Bible uses for the word remnant. And in fact, if you look at it, actually it looks the same in the original language. It's just like slightly changed. And so Zephaniah picked this word on purpose because he wanted us to think, oh, there's some that are left. There's a remnant that is left. And he wanted us to remember about a different remnant that he talked about before in chapter one, verse four, right? And I will cut off from this place the remnant of Baal. It's time to pick a side. Zephaniah is saying, guys, it's time to pick a side. If you wanna be part of the remnant of Baal, you're gonna be cut off. If you want to be part of the remnant of God, you're going to be protected because God is your warrior and your protector. See, the people in Zephaniah's day were very wrong in their assumptions about God because God will do good and he will do ill. In fact, that's the entire message of the book of Zephaniah. Somebody asks you, what's the message of the book of Zephaniah? You can point them back to what the people's hearts said. In chapter 1, verse 12, those who say in their hearts, the Lord will not do good, nor will he do ill. In fact, Zephaniah is saying, you know what? I'm going to write this entire book. I'm going to record all of these messages to show you that that is the wrong attitude to have about God. Because God will do good, and he will do ill. It just depends on what side you are on. We need to pick a side. You know, one of the the tenets of Scripture um, one of the things that, that theologians say that Scripture kind of says about itself or is, is, has made known about itself is that, uh, and I'm probably butchering it a little bit, but it, it, it's that uh, everything in Scripture that needs to be made clear has been made clear in order for us to attain salvation and to live a life pleasing to God. And, and the, the fact that that, um, that that is true, that everything that God wanted to make clear is clear, And the other things that are kind of confusing, it's okay if we don't understand them, but the things that we need to know are here is really really, um, really, uh, comforting to me. Um, But the same thing is true here. God God hasn't made it hard to understand. He didn't make it hard for the Israelites in Zephaniah's day to understand, and, and a quick page through the New Testament for us, it's not hard for us to understand either. I mean, it's like, uh, how many of you guys have seen those, those shirts that say, uh, come to the dark side, we have cookies, right? How many of you have that shirt? I know Keenan does. No? Man, Keenan, need to work on your t-shirt game, man. <laughs> but you guys have seen those shirts, right? And they, they're on bumper stickers. They're like everywhere, right? And it's like, okay, yeah, it's the dark side, but they have cookies, right? And there's like a little Darth Vader, and he's like holding up a tray of cookies like, yeah, it's the dark side, but it's a little sketch, but come on over. We have cookies, right? I mean, you know exactly what you're getting into. That's the same thing with God's word. We know exactly what happens when we follow our pride and we follow ourselves and we say, you know what, God, shut up. I don't need you screwing around in my life. I've got it on my own. We know where that gets us. And we know where falling on our our knees in humble humility before God and repentance and, and following him in righteousness and justice, we know where that gets us too. The book of Zephaniah has a lot to say about that. If you guys would just read along with me, verses 14 through 20, and just just soak this in. This 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 is what Zephaniah has for God's people. This is the side that he wants them so desperately to choose. Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exalt with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. 
the king of Israel, the Lord is in your midst. You shall never again fear evil. On that day, it shall be said to Jerusalem, fear not, O Zion, let your hands not grow weak. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love, and he will exalt over you with loud singing. We sing a lot of worship songs to God, but have you ever thought about the fact that, that God will someday sing over us because he is so glad that we are his? Verse 18, I will gather those of you who mourn for the festival so that you will no longer suffer reproach. Behold, at that time, I will deal with all your oppressors. I will save the lame and gather the outcasts and I will change their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. At that time, I will bring you in at the time when I gather you together for I will make you renowned and praised among the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord. My friends, this this is the side This is God's side. This is the side that we want to pick. This is what we want for our lives now and in eternity. See, this passage is is the fulfillment of this passage is in Jesus, our Lord and Savior, and it's partially fulfilled now. Right? It says, the King of Israel, the Lord is in your midst. You shall never again fear, fear evil. Jesus Christ, he came down from heaven. His name is Emmanuel, God with us. The Lord is in your midst. Jesus Christ came down, is with us. He died, he he paid the price for our sins. He's he's allowed us to escape from our unity of sin and death like Nicholas talked about the other week. And and, and Jesus Christ has came and then what did he do? He went back to heaven, but what did he do after that? He left his Holy Spirit with us, God with us. And you know what Jesus is gonna do someday? He's gonna come back again. And if you wanna know about that story, read Revelation 20 and 21. It's like almost an identical passage with the book of Zephaniah. And, and so much of it is similar and it talks about these same things with, with dealing with all of the oppressors. I will save the lame, gather the outcasts. I will change their shame into praise. Jesus is going to come back and he's gonna make all things new. But you know what? When Jesus comes back, the assumptions about God are gonna be wrong again because when Jesus comes back, he's gonna do both good and ill. It just matters what side we're on. The Israelites of this time, they said, we listen to no voice, we accept no correction, we do not trust in the Lord, and we don't draw near to God. My friends, let us not become complacent in our sin. Let us instead listen to the voice of Jesus, accept his correction, trust in him, and draw near to him. It's time to wake up, pick a side, because Jesus wins. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we come to you now, God, and we, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you for um, the prophets and their boldness to say um, all of these things, and we thank you for the people that recorded it for us to, to know more about you and to know more about what you desire for us. God, I pray that if, if we, well, for all of us that have even just a little bit of inkling of the same attitudes of the Israelites, God, I just pray that we would find it and we would get rid of it. I pray that we would, we would wake up to the eternal realities of our lives, to the bigger picture that is going on. I pray that we would draw near to you and, and, and that we would draw near to your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And I pray all this in Jesus' name.